hon säger att det här inte är hennes liv, att hon vill byta bort det. Då vill vara någon annan. Jag orkar inte tänka, jag orkar inte känna så här. Det är nu vet den här verkligheten, jag hatar den här verkligheten. Det vore härligt att vara någon annan en stund. Jag fattar precis hur du menar. Jag vill vara där vi var någon annan stund. Jag bor gärna lite på hotell. Jag är nästan. Jag är på kurs. Trauma, bearbetningskurs. Alla respekterar mig. Och vi knullar med andra. Jag är stark som en som en Maya Indian. Varför slutar ni? Om ska göra ont. Jag kommunicerar bara min smärta. Kvinnan som bara kunde välja vad hon ville känna i olika situationer. Hon beskrev sitt inre som ett hotell. Så so good att se dig. Jag var rädd att du skulle kanske. Berätta mig var vi går. Det är väldigt speciellt. Vi offrar våra gäster en service kreativ för och by den individuellen. Freedom of choice is our utmost concern, and serving that choice is our aim. Your leaving will take place in six days from now. What are you doing with these people? We're helping them. This is a free zone without the world to judge. There are some things I wanted to talk about, so I wrote them down. What are you doing? You want me to sit in this place in front of this woman and talk about our childhood? You never wanted to talk about it. But I really think that we should get out of here. If you leave, I'll still do it. You don't automatically become a better person just because you've lived your life in front of tears. Sometimes you have to shut things out to survive. That's what everything has always been about. You and your fucking spiral. Firework! Hi, this is James Velasquez, and welcome to the Masterclass for Directors, presented by Kultur Akademin. Today we'll be speaking to Lisa Langseth. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for being here. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, how you got into this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Stockholm, and I started as a scriptwriter for theater, mm -hmm. like a, uh, a playwright. And I went to uh, Dramatisk Institutet, which is like, yeah, now it's called SKH. In, in, in Stockholm, and I started there at their course for playwriters. So I thought I started with the theatre, basically. Mm. Mm. You come from a theatre background. In fact, your first play, Den Elskida, or The Loved Ones, premiered uh, at Dramaten in 2004. That's just two years after graduating from Dramatic Institute. How was that a game changer for you? How did that make things, how did that change things for you? I started to work immediately, but the first play was called uh, Gold Chant, which is also became my first short film, mm. uh, which was taking place in Stadsteatern. It was huge for me, yeah. of course, because it was, uh, I never worked profi professional before, and it was like a new world was opening up, and, uh, and also I was so happy to direct myself, because I had, didn't direct in, at school, because the school wasn't allowed us to direct our own pieces. Mm. Um, but I also became a director with those plays. Uh, I was I was feeling kind of free and very grateful, I think, for for just that they let let me in the culture world because uh, I was not sure about that. Because also I had a struggle in school. I thought it was really really hard to go to that school because I had, when I came to the school I had an idea that I wanted to do and everything I wanted to write and I wanted to direct and I wanted to you know make my own pieces and the school was divided in different sections. So it's like I had to work, I had to write for other uh, theater directors. Which uh, which I didn't get along with because I wanted to do <laughs> wanted to direct <laughs> myself, so I came into com 
a lot of conflicts. Mm. And uh, when we were ending the school, I was not allowed to do my uh, my ending performance at, at, at any theater because I didn't find any director that wanted to work with me because mm. I had fought fights with everybody. <laughs> so I directed my own pieces at the school. Everybody else was directing on theaters, a real theater. So I directed my own piece at the school in a small conference room, basically. Okay. And I find some people that were not, uh, you know, they were unemployed actors that I find, okay, we're gonna do my play in this. And it was a really, really angry play and it was grotesque and that was good chant. And it was really, you know, it was just too much. It was, it was porn, it was violence, it was, you know, everything. And we didn't have any money at all. So we just did there. Numira Pass was playing the main role before she got famous. And, you know, all these great people coming there and just putting, their whole soul and uh, you know into mm. this little piece into this little conference room mm. uh, and then f suddenly the the, the main uh, theater Stadstjaten in Stockholm which is one of the biggest theater came there because everybody was talking about it and they said okay you can perform it at Stadstjaten and we got a small stage there and we could do it like a real play okay. and I think that journey made me uh, made me trust more uh, in my own work and also my intuition that like, okay, I can do this and yeah. I have to find my own way to do things. Mm. Did you think you, f did you think you found your process there, of the directing process? Was that, was that sort of where you found out what worked and what you, f or was it still an experimental, you know what I mean? Like, or did you, did you discover your process there as well in, in doing the play? Um, what worked I, for you? I, I, Oh, I mean, it's it's a life journey to to understand your process, and I think the process changes. So, but but I I understood uh, something about working with actors because I didn't have any education in directing, so I created a very close atmosphere where we talked about everything. You know, I, we just made a deal. Okay, in this room. You can say anything. It's okay, and you can say, okay, I don't, uh, I don't know what to do now, or you know. So, so it's like, and we became very close, and this, in, in, it was just four actors, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, and this process was very, mm, it was just beautiful for me as a as a person and also as a director. And I understood, I understood that I don't believe so much in methods, you know, okay. and, and oh. because you can, when it comes to direct, uh, when you come to to actors, mm. I think it's. It's just you have you have to have a clear vision vision of what you want to do, and then just talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and mm. be open to to you know change things that doesn't work and so mm. on. So mm. that's that's been the method I think yeah. uh, in terms of uh, actors later on as you well. You sort of created a safe space where yeah. anything goes, yeah. which brought everybody closer. Yeah, and, and make people brave to go even further. Yeah. I mean, but they were also brave actors. So it's, uh, mm. I, I was, it was, um, I was just, I was also gifted to, to have these people sure. around me. Yeah. How do yeah. you, how do you create that safe space on a, for a film shoot? Uh, for me, the important job is doing is done bef have to be done before you get to set. Like, mm. so you have to if it's a, if it's a, uh, a main character, it's important for me that we did so much work before we got to set, and it doesn't have to be that we rehearsed, you know, the specific scenes. But we had to find our own language, how to work together with this character. Every character has a soul, right? Which might not be in the script so clearly. Mm. So you have to have the voice of this character's soul uh, and, and you have to have a language for that. So to create a, a language with the actors about, you know, what, what's the core in this character? What, what, what's the soul? What's the problem? And if you have that conversation and have it really, really clear and stable before you get to set, you can kind of lean on that discussion even on mm. set when it gets really, really stressing, get really, really chaotic. It's like you can go back to, you know, the core of the character. But I think it's hard to create that core on set. When you're on set, it's so stressful and the pressure is so high. And, and, and it's also so much pressure on the actors and also on you because you don't have the time that you need. So the discussions, I think, when it really worked well for me, the discussions have been done before. Mm. I, I think I got that from the theater basically because in the theater you rehearse for eight weeks and you're so close to the actors all the time and you discuss uh, all the problems and all the fears yeah. and everything and you test so much. I'm a little afraid of rehearsing when it comes to film because you can rehearse it until it dies. So it's like 
the, the magic moment is gone when you start the camera because you just, you know, rehearse it too much. But I think you have to be, uh, agree what you're going to do and what's important in the scene and what's important for the character and what's mm. important for Jan. And if you have that and a flexibility to that, you can, you can, uh, you can be more free and also work very effectively. When you do a TV series, you have so many roles, so maybe yeah. it's not possible to do it oh. with every role, but all the bigger roles, I think. And uh, uh, for example, me and Ida, uh, uh, Engvall, who was playing the main character in Love and Anarchy 1 and, and, and 2, uh, when the script was ready, uh, we sat down, we booked a week over the phone because it, <laughs> in yeah. the middle of the summer, and we talked through every scene in the whole script and we develop a language for the character, what is she going through? So when we go to set, we have talked about the scene and we know where she is, uh, mm. where Sophie is heading at. And I ha and we can talk very, very, you know, quick and, and, and briefly. We don't even have to talk so much on set because we know the character so well. Mm. It becomes more calm in a good way. You followed all the first play with a few other plays. Then you took Gudshan and made it into a novel film. Mm. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in a way, it seems you were naturally preparing for the transition into film. Or was it just an opportunity you couldn't pass on? Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. No, I didn't prepare for it, but I was, uh, I, um, I was, I was say attracted to film. I thought film was, was really, really interesting. Uh, I thought, uh, and I also actually got a little bit bored of, of the scene. I mean, mm. I think, I think theatre is, is wonderful, but it was something that, okay, this is, is a, the stage is a limit. And uh, for me, it was interesting to, to see mm, uh, how can I work with actors in another way, or I just mm. wanted to go further and further and further. And then I got the opportunity actually, for, because there was a producer and she saw uh, a good chant, uh, uh uh, at this small performance at the school and she was just blown away about it. So she called me and said like, could you turn this into a 30 min minutes film? And I got like, uh, because the play was 90 minutes. So it's just like, no, it doesn't feel possible, but just think about it. And then it was just, like you said, it was, yeah, okay, why not? I mean, let's just test, you know, let's, mm. let's just see if it's possible. Mm. And we struggled to get it financed for uh, many years. I, 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 I had it on the side as, as I worked, continued to work with theatre, and, uh, and we got no, you know, one year, and no, 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 no. And then we did it for, I think it was half the budget that it was, you know, supposed to have, yeah. <laughs> and we just shot it. And, and it, this, that was my film school, actually, to be, because when I was on set the first time, I have never been on set before, and I have none, never, <laughs> I didn't have, you know, I, as I directed the, the theater piece, basically once, because I did it one at school and one then back on the real the uh, theater, I know, I know, knew the piece, I know every line, I wrote it myself, I know it by heart, how it was supposed to be. I knew what I wanted from, from the actors. Yeah. But I didn't know anything about camera editing and you know how the process of shooting was. So I had just a wonderful team that we, we right. really had um, patient with me. Actually, what was the first day like for you? Uh, I, I remember I after the first day. I remember I walked out, uh, uh, you know, in the forest and just kind of leaned down. <laughs> it was in the night. <laughs> I got like, this is the hardest work I ever, you know, done. I thought it was just because I was not used to just the basic, basic, basic things of, you know, what what, what picture do I need to, to, together with that picture and how can I just put things together? And I think I got such a lovely, <clears throat> it was such a lovely work to, uh, to the DOP, which is called Simon Proudenstern, which also made my first and second feature film, which is a wonderful person. And I got like, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know how to, you know, you know. And he said to me, which I think was just such a wonderful thing to say. He said, look, you know this story and you know what you want to tell. Just do it. And I saw it out with you. But I worked with so many directors that know exactly how, how, where to put the camera and how to edit it. They have not any idea of the story or the heart in the story or what they really want to tell. Mm -hmm. So that was just, he gave me the confidence to just trust in the actors. And then I learned, you know, during the way, and I also listened to him a lot. So <clears throat> it, was, it was a really nice collaboration, actually. Yeah. Mm. Were there a couple of things you were just like, wow, 
like you didn't realize about film. Do you know what I mean? Like how uh, that you were just kind of like, wow, you can do that? Wow, you can do yeah, this? Yeah, you can cheat so much yeah. on film in yeah. a good way and in an interesting way that you can, you can be so flexible because when it's theater, you know, the actors have to carry this yeah. whole a piece because they're going to be on stage. You have to work and you have to work really, really from the ground and you have to build things. And mm. now I work with uh, uh, amateurs that were, you know, mm. 16 years old and even younger. And it's like, but I could, I could put, I realized I could cheat, you know, I just get a little glimpse of, of this perfect look and I, I could cut away the rest and all these things that, that are, you know, the base of making films. But since I haven't, you know, Mm, yeah. knew anything about it it was mind-blowing for me and also it was wonderful for me it was wonderful to to work with them um, and in editing that you could see you could get so close to an, uh, to an actor you can tell you could take out so much lines because you can tell with the expression yeah. of the face and also to work with music afterwards and work with the rhythm that you can create in editing that you have you have so much freedom at the same time so it's I think filmmaking is also a mix of so many different art forms. Your stories tend to tackle class and power struggles. Upper class versus middle class in Love and Anarchy. An older man versus a younger student in Pure, uh, which are often broad discussions. How do you narrow it down in order to create a 90-minute feature or a six-part series? Every character in, in my pieces have, carries uh, a, a, a class with them. Um, I think, um, I mean, it's so it's important that that you feel the class uh, through the character, that you know wh where it comes from and that you feel it through the characters and you feel it th through the way that people talk and dress and behave. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, I think it's basically to know that in, in when you create a character from the beginning. Um, but of course, it's 90 minutes, it's one thing, and when you do a series, it's like you have so much more space, so it's like you can twist and turn sure. things back and forward a little bit more. Mm. Mm. Um, how, much, how much do you draw from your own personal experiences when, you, when you're creating stuff? If you I think it's an interesting question, because uh, I, I would say that every, everything is personal or nothing is personal. It's like, it's like, it has to be personal for me in a way, for otherwise I don't get any energy to do it. So it's like, it's, it's just a method of, of but, but it doesn't have to be my life. That would be so boring because my life is not so interesting. So it's like, it's like, but I take pieces from, from my soul and I put it into characters. Uh, so in one way, and that's also a way for me to know, for me to know the characters. And I also feel that's a way for me when I meet the actors. Like, okay, there's a little bit of my soul in your character. So I know this character, right? So it doesn't have to be, <clears throat> I mean, for example, if you have Friedrich in Love and Anarchy, he comes from me as well, but he's an old uh, man who doesn't look like it comes from me or maybe it doesn't have but I, I, I can understand him I have he, he, there's also something with him too you know he becomes always misunderstood he, 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 he's struggling with his higher goals and his love for high culture <laughs> and nobody understands him I, 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 I I can, I can, I can, <laughs> I can go for that uh, uh, so it's like I think that's that's uh, so yeah comes from me yeah can you give us uh, an insight into your writing process, idea to script? Mm, do you have routines? When I, when I wrote uh, theater plays, I got more of a feeling and I wrote really freely and you know, and when I did my first uh, feature film, I, 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 I thought, okay, I'm gonna write, you know, just write, you know. For me, it's like this. It's like first at the beginning, when, you, when, you, when you're going to find an mm -hmm. idea, you have to be completely open and completely free and you can, you know, write whatever you want to. There's no rules. You could do, you could do it, you know, as a monologue or you could do it, oh, this was a nice scene or you could steal from other directors. You, you could do whatever you like, you know, whatever you like. Uh, but after a while now, I try to take all these ideas or, or, or dreams or whatever it is or longings and, and put it into a synopsis on a really early stage that is like five and six pages. And I try to, you know, build the story from, uh, from the beginning to the end on these five to six pages. And that is t to force myself to see if it's a story or not, or if it's a good story and what does it need. Because if I go down and I write 
the, the, the script from the beginning, mm. I guess lost in the material, but because the material is so huge and it's so much possibilities. And if you go, if you have a whole film script and you're going to rewrite it again and again and again, which is going to happen when you get yeah. into financing, it, the rewriting takes month, right? It's like you're going to get exhausted. And also, if you put it into five to six pages, you see really clearly, okay, I don't have a good ending. That's a problem, right? And it's going to take you an hour to test a new ending or even less, 10 minutes. Okay, I test this and I test this. You can, you can move things around really clearly if you only have these pages, uh, which you can't do if you have to change the dialogue in a whole script. But, but on the same side, I think it's important to have this chaotic document or mind board or whatever it is that you could put anything you can be inspired of anybody mm. or, or whatever you want to do but this synopsis i think is really it's a bit painful to, to because you <laughs> see everything so clearly yeah. like this is this this is not working this is boring or has to i also work on this uh, five, five pages with the con uh, clearly you know, first, second, third act. It sounds really boring, but I, I really believe that that makes me, you know, see clearly, okay, what's the start of the story? What's the core of the story? And what's the ending of the story and it all. And it's, it's just to find a structure in this. And also it's easier to talk about your project in an early stage with your producer or with the finances and so on, instead of me coming with something I work for, for a year, a year and, you know, put it, uh, it's, the critic can be really, really hard. If you have your five pages, mm. it's like clearly, you can more clearly see if this is something that people want to do, or if they don't want to do it, I can go somewhere else, I can change my producer, I can change the financing, or is it something in, the, in the, this idea that doesn't really work? Should I continue or not? Mm. Because that is the, one of the most common questions I get when I, mm. when I talk to f students, it's like, how do you know if your idea is the right one or not? Yeah. How do you know? That's really, really hard. But I think, the, uh, I, I guess you never know. I mean, but, but you have to make a choice um, where, where you have to decide it's, it's good enough, I'm gonna shoot this. But that's so much later on. That's when mm. you, you're into shooting. You can't stay on set. Oh, is this, is this idea working or not? You, you, you just have to take away that anxious. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, you can bring it back in the editing room, maybe like, oh my God, it didn't work. But you can't work as a director if you completely ask yourself, is, is the idea good enough? You know, because yeah. it's, it's too late. How much do you trust your idea? If you take Love and Anarchy, for example, how, uh, how, was there a point in that process of coming with, uh, on that idea where you just went, yeah? Or was, uh, it the, was it people saying, yeah, this is a great idea, let's make this? Uh, yeah, Love and Anarchy changed a lot. In the beginning, it was a feature film. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I kind of fall in love with the character Sophie. I loved her. And I also thought, I, I love the relationship with Max. And I also thought the publishing house was really interesting, you know, because I could put so much thought about the, the, uh, our society and how we live together today and how we look at art into the publishing house in different characters. When I made it into a TV series, I realized this could really work as a series because I, the structure made, worked as a series. It, it had a structure for a TV series and I didn't realize that before I tested it. But it's basically the same idea. It's the same ending and the same start and the same core. Mm. But I could have more characters, more, you know, and it was just fun to make it that way. Hey! Hey! Should you have slutat? Hey, Max! Hello, Sofie. How are you with you? Have you had a good summer? I think I've had a fantastic summer. Wow! We have also the glad news. Be VD for Lund and Lagerstedt. Sofie Rydman. Vad är det som händer? Det hade ju ändå aldrig funkat mellan oss. För, för du blev ju chef, eller? Ja, men precis. Jag heter jag Filip. Jag är sensitivitetskonsult här på förlaget. Och mitt jobb är att jobba med er värdegrund. Absolut. Förlaget har precis knutit Vivian Ivarsen till sitt stall. Ett gott råd bara. Ligg inte med Vivian. Vi har ett stort problem. Ända sedan du började på förlaget så har det känts underbart att gå till jobbet. Det här är Sofie. Hej! Men 
tycker väl om att låtsas med en katt. Du är så jävla konstig, Sofie. Får fast i upp ditt liv, det är bara det jag säger. Det räcker. Pappa, vad har du gjort? Tror du att du hatar mig? Allt är som, som om jag hör det. Så inte igen. Vilken bra dag! And then uh, when Netflix saw it, they got like, yes, you know, for these five pages. Actually. They just read the four, five okay. pages and got like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and I had so much material. I worked for year, one year, one and a half year. Huh? I had a feature film. I had so many, you know, script. I had so many, you know, uh, they didn't see that. It just went for the five pages. In this uh, fluid uh, area, when you build a story for a while, so that you find that you make the right decisions, because these are the decisions that you're gonna w live with for years. Mm. So don't rush the, you know, the beginning of it. Like, okay, uh, maybe uh, if I have a subject, okay, I know I want to work. You know, I want to I want to say something about this subject. Uh, uh, that's a good first step, really, really good. But then it comes like, okay, how, what environment, and which character can do I need to to say the things that I want to say? You know, so it's, mm. so it's like, and just stay there for a while, and yeah, make it dream about it, fantasize, and look at super much different kind of films or stories or read books or whatever, and then try to make. A story of it. I think that's that's a process that that I can keep coming back to again and again and again. And I think it, yeah, that's the wonderful thing. That's something I I think happens when you know that you're on track. It's like that you feel that the stories the stories start to live its own life. So it's basically not you anymore thinking about is this good or bad. It's more like. Oh my God! Okay, here's a character, and he speaks so much. He has so much yeah. things to say. He want to be in the story. He could yeah. talk for ages. Okay, let him be. You know. So then, after a while, is I think that's something. It's the same process as as a as a literature writer. I mean, who writes for literature that they feel like the story just, you know, the flow is coming on, and you just have to write it down yourself. You have yeah. to, you know, hang on to it and so. So it's, uh, I think if you get to that, I think that's, that, that's when you really know that you're yeah, on track. Yeah. Mm. It feels like when you, when you can start to have a conversation with yourself yeah. as these characters yeah. and it yeah. just flows, yeah. that's when you... And they start to fight with each other and you, <laughs> has to, you, know, you just have to write the fight down. And yeah. yeah, I love uh, that process. It's uh, wonderful. Mm. Do you write with the budget in mind or do you try to steer clear from creative constraints? When you find uh, the soul of what you want to do, you have to be completely free in that process. Like, okay, this is... This is what I want to tell and the soul of it. But I think it's good to be a little bit realistic in, in, <laughs> in when you're gonna, you know, when you get further on, like, okay, how, how, which kind of budget will I need to tell this, this kind of story? Uh, because you see a lot of people that want to do the first feature, th they fail on this. Sometimes you write things in the script that cost a lot of money that you don't really need and why should you put a lot of money into that if you don't need it it, it, it doesn't you don't need it for tell the heart of the story and i think it's it's just good to know in the beginning what kind of film are you writing because the finance sy sy systems are so different i mean if you are transport coppola and you want to do a big film in new york you probably have the financing that could, that you could do do it in the way that you mm. want to do but if, if you're not Franz Ford Coppola and want to do your first film, it's better to, to take the, the, the themes uh, that you want to say and put it in, in a place where it's more realistic, 
is, is uh, for example, for for the the Swedish film industry, mm. because if it's that that you're gonna make it, try to to kneel the story down so you get to the core of the story and mm. try to be clear of what you what you really what kind of money do you really need. For my film Euphoria, the start was taking uh, taking place in a uh, in a train, and they were going by train through Europe. <laughs> and they <were> through different <laughs> stations, you know. Right, right. And then I realized I put my whole budget in the first 10 minutes of this film. If you're gonna go, if they're gonna go, uh, you know, by train through Europe, this, uh, this uh, 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 main characters, you're gonna see all the, you have to have so much extras, you have to dress a train, you have to, you know, in, a, in different countries and blah, blah, blah. And then I realized, do I really need this? Is it important? Or could it just go by car in a forest? And I realized, you know, the dialogue could basically be the same. I didn't need the whole contact because that was not really important. I could, so yeah, I ended up putting them in a hotel room, uh, on an airport and in a car. And it basically came out, you know, the same. But I could take the money that we had um, because there, there is, there is you, you always need more money. That, that's the thing, right? Even though if you do a very expensive film, you won't have enough money. So that's, that's sure. happening all the time. Yeah, or even yeah. if you do a really, really small film or a big film, sure. because some people think that, okay, I do a huge film, I have enough money. No, because the, the, you have huge actors and the actors cost so much each day. So they, you know, everything swallows your money. So in the end, you're standing there, oh, I need more time and I need more money. It's, you always need more time, you always need more, ne more money. Mm. Yeah. Uh, do you have actors in mind when you're during the writing process? Do you think of an actor? This would be. Do you ever write for an actor? Uh, no, I think that's scary because um, maybe you have one actor in the beginning uh, in mind, and then when you write, you, sh you, you think, that, okay, now the story doesn't work. You want to change, and so I think it's it's more it's better for me to to when I know the characters and I know the story, and then I talk to the actors because I don't want to. <clears throat> And I don't think if you have them in mind, you know, you know, you never know that you're really going to get them. So, so it's like hanging up on, on a specific person that you might not even know and, you know, mm -hmm. think that, OK, I really, really need, need this person. I think also sometimes the story, if you do that, maybe that's a, there could also be a way to escape from the story. Is it a good story? I mean, you have to build a good story and then you can have a brilliant actor. Mm. Otherwise, I haven't done my job. If I just hang it on to a brilliant actor, in the end of the days, maybe, you know, a brilliant actor is wonderful, but it won't make a brilliant film immediately because you have to have a good story and you have to have a good dialogue and so on for the brilliant actor to deal with. So I think uh, I'm not against it. I know a lot of directors do that, but for, for me, I think it's a little bit fragile. You have this five-page synopsis that is you're very strict with, and that's your. And then you have this, you have a sort of um, a chalkboard where you clutter things on ideas, right? Mm. That's the picture mm. that I get. Mm. Uh, and then you have this five-page synopsis. Do you shop around for producers, or do you have producers in mind, or do you tend to work with the same, or do you like to yeah, work with the same? I think it's lovely to work with the same if it works. Oh. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. if it doesn't work, you have to change. I mean, so, yeah. so it's like, and I think my experience is like if you. If you have a really tight working process, process with the producer, maybe you work, you've done a few films together, sure. and after a while you can find yourself in a project when it doesn't really work anymore. And I mean, we are all grown ups and we develop in different ways. And so I think it's, it's. Uh, I mean, I think there is no point to change pr uh, producer at uh, every project. I think it's lovely, and I like to have a producer on my side when I develop because it's. Uh, um, <clears throat> I need someone to talk to. <laughs> I don't like to work completely by myself. It's like you get crazy after a while. And, and uh, I mean, the producer is important in so many steps because uh, the producer is also <clears throat> responsible for which kind of financing you invite to the project. Mm. And the kind of fin financing that you invite will infect the project, right? So it's like you have to have a pr producer that understands that, that where the money comes from, Mm. you know, mm. will infect the project in different ways. And the financing system is such a jungle. So it's like it's also the producer's job to realize, OK, this is a finance that want to change the project or this is a finance that want to do the same thing that we want to do. Or it's, you need the producer to also defend the project during the process. Uh, so you don't have a producer that invites, you know, anyone to the project and you right. because 
different money have different interests. I think it's really, really important to understand that. Once the script is finished, what's next for Lisa? What's next in your process? How do you prepare for the actual shoot? What's the process like for you there? What are, what are the things that you think about mostly? The first step is to see how can the script fit with reality. So it's like basically, okay, like budget issues and like where should we shoot it and, and have a first check on locations, I think is really important. And, uh, and, um, and, and be kind of free in that state. And also if it's people that you, 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 the casting process take a lot of time for me, but because I, I put a lot of effort in the casting process and I want to meet the actors. And, and also I, um, I also pre-shoot with the actors a lot before they got a role. And it's, it's not it, like, oh, is he or she good enough? It's not for me about that. It's more about finding are we the right ones to, to, to work together? It's also an opportunity for the, the actors to say, no, I don't want to work with you. So it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a good, it's a good way to see, okay, is, is, are we going to work together? Is this the right setup for this? And I put a lot of, of energy and time in that to find the right, uh, find the right actors. And, um, and also, of course, start the process with uh, set designers and uh, DOP as like how are we gonna and, and, but in the beginning I think it's important to be quite free and just not lock into how it should be and more be like watch film together say talk about what inspires you and and feel the happiness about it because it's going to be harder and harder and harder and harder work so it's important to have this a little uh, time of just free creative energy, yeah. How important is the DOP, the production designer, and the costume and makeup? That's the hard thing as a director, that is, everything is important, right? Mm. Every detail is important. Sure. And it, you have to kind of, you know, uh, go back and, and see, okay, see the whole pictures. I think that's something that, that I've been training about a lot, also on set and also before set, like, okay, w what is the most important thing now? And, and not get drowned in details in the beginning and of course the DRP is really important because that's the one that you also need during the whole set so it's, it really has it has to work it really really has to work mm. but I think it's it's uh, it's a bit tricky because it's not it doesn't really have to work like uh, that your personality works I mean you could have a wonderful collaboration with someone that you don't really know but you really work well together yeah so it's it's I think it's important not to spend so much time of getting to know each other in <laughs> in mm. a personal way I'm not so interested in that actually no. I mean I okay are you married or not okay you know whatever but but it's like it's like more how do you want to work and to focus on the work even if you have and to start to know each other through work because I think that's a wonderful thing with making film that you can so good collaboration with people that you never would spend time with yeah. <laughs> outside of film set yeah. or you don't understand each other at all but when you work so good together and you can have a flow together with people so the rhythm I think is really important to talk about in the beginning because I mean if you have Love and Anarchy for example I, I know it's going to be fast I, I mean, it's a bit of a rom-com it has to be fast it has to be jokes it's so many people in the in, in the mm. same setting which is like that's why we decided to have, shoot with to, uh, two cameras for example which I have not worked with before but mm. to, 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 you have to have pictures on everybody you have to see okay you have to if you shoot humor for example it's another way of shooting than I, and when you shoot drama mm -hmm. it's, it's a, another kind of set and thing for the di DOP and also for you so so you don't have okay you have the idea that it should be like dan 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 and then you know this is the rhythm this is but dam bam bam and then bam and mm. then da 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 and, and and that's also a bit like music basically and you have so so you have to have the pictures and the fast work mm. that you can that you that, that you have the material that you can that then can edit in the editing room so you don't think like oh we're going to have it like this and then you end up in the editing room with long camera shoots it's, it's just like you would never get the the oh. the, the, the tempo or, and the rhythm that, that that you that you were longing for and this is something you have to talk from about at the first meeting i mean it's a completely different thing to when i shot euphoria it was our goal was to make you know the film was about death but it would be i i thought it, uh, my goal was to make a very beautiful and kind of romantic setting when we talk about death mm. which also was the kind of a provocative 
things to do. And also the nature was really important, but the nature wanted to grow, and it was the contrast about people in the film that wanted to die, to sh and then to shoot in a comfort room, six people talking like this. Yeah. You know, it's, uh. it's, another, it's a completely different way to work. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that first meeting and, and creating that visual style is what's important. Yeah, and, and then... I, th I think as a director, it's important what you want to do. Of course, you do everything together when you do a film, but it's, it's your responsibility as, as a... You have to remind yourself that your responsibility as a director is to, to, to stay with your vision and to explain that and see what you can get. And then you can get much more than you even thought was possible, but, but, but you are responsible for the vision. I think that's, that's important to remind yourself of that. Mm. Mm -hmm. How do you find that, that, that uh, vision? How do you come upon that vision? I, 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 that's what I work in when I work, with the five, when I work on the five pages. That's like, like, okay, how many characters? Is this like a film with like two characters in the house? Or is it a film with uh, 20 characters that talk all the time, all the time, all the time? I think the early that you have that, it's more easy to also write the script because then you know what kind of script you write. So for me, it's, it's, it's the really the starting point, yeah. yeah. If we go over to sort of the actual directing, let's say the day before shooting uh, on, on Love and Anarchy, what, what were you doing? You know, to be well prepared, try to do focus on the job and then I hopefully can go home and get some sleep and then I woke up at I don't know, five in the morning and continues. It's like, it's, it's like a marathon, you know? It's, mm. it's like you also have to think that you're gonna, be, you're gonna be doing this for such a long time and you have to have energy all the way. Mm. Like, I mean, all the way. I saw a wonderful interview with Jane Campion the other day <laughs> and she was so wonderful because she was talking all the time. You know, it's so exhausting. It's so exhausting. Yeah. It's also, and, and I think it's sometimes it's, you're not allowed to talk about that, but, uh, but it's also, I th that's why, that's why I, I felt when I, also my own experience and also the, the, when you see young directors, it's like they don't understand how much, work, how much work it is. So it's like you have to be a little bit, um, I mean, choose your fights, mm. I would say. Mm. Mm. Talk about what your role is as a director on set. How, how, how do you take this, especially some, with something you wrote, how do you take that and now, now, now suddenly you're, 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 you have people around you that, do, you, know, that you have to be in charge, you, you have to be an arbit, or do you say a work leader, you also have to be, you know, you, you're a human being, so you have to, that plays into factor and you have to lead this, you have this vision, mm. which is leading you all the way through. Mm. How, how, how do, what is your... I try to focus on the vision all the time, yeah. and kind of to forget myself, because it's, and, and don't get into prestige, you know, because it's just gonna, you know, it's, uh, it's never gonna work. In, uh, for me, it doesn't work. For me, it's just the vision, the vision, the vision. Mm. And if you have a clear vision, you can also be open to, then an actor comes and goes like, oh, I don't like this line, can I say it in th this way? And then you just think about the vision. Does it work with the vision? Or does it, do, does it not work with the vision? No, it, yeah, it works with the vision. It's okay. It's, it doesn't really matter, or it doesn't work with the vision. Then you can say that. Okay, it, it, the, then it's not the prestige about, you know, again, you and the actor. It's, about, it's just about the vision. Mm. You know, the vision is this. Mm. So it's like, so, so you don't, don't get, because, um, so you don't become a leader that just want to, you know, be a good director because that's not really interesting. The only thing that's interesting is what is coming out in the end. Because you can be such a great director on set and everybody, oh, 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 oh. And then in the end, if the film is bad, I mean, pff, no one will work with you again. That's fact. I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just, it's just, you have to, you, to stay with the vision. And that's also a way for me to let go of the ego and you make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. It's not possible to go through a shooting process and be perfect. It, does, it doesn't exist. Mm. Uh, we talked a little bit about, about rehearsals um, before on set mm. as a director. Rehearsing or just shooting? What do you prefer? Uh, yeah, uh, this is based on that you had all the big discussions before you get to set, right? right. So it's like the, 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 you are close with the actors, you created a language with the actors, the actors know what you're going to do, and, and the vision is clear, right? Yeah, it's, 
yeah, we work together. So you yeah. <laughs> how did we do it? You, you get to set and you get to set probably with the DIRP and the, the first assistant director and you're there before everybody else and you kind of check out. OK, and then we start to read the scene, hmm. the three of us and see, OK, uh, this is my idea where everybody should stand in the scene. OK, Sophie is coming in coming in from from that way and they're going to have a fight and I think we're going to put it here and you, so you just block it with the DRP and the first assistant and you read it through and you block it and you have some kind of idea of okay this is how where we're going to stand because that's the question of what the camera's going to be so it's important mm. and actors comes in and you say okay we have an idea that you should stand here and you should stand there and just just you know walk walk it through and read it you don't have to act it out. I think if you work with great actors, it's better to save the acting for, for the camera because maybe it's 6.30 in the morning, everybody's tired, and maybe they don't have enough energy to make 10 perfect shoots. So if, and also if you work with amateurs, they, they don't know how to do the, the great thing again and again. So it's just like, it's better to save that. I, I, th that's my experience. And then you have a time with the, the DOP to put the camera and put the, the right light on and, 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 you know, fix the set so it's like ready to get shoot. And then the actors come and then you shoot it. I decided that so many years ago that you should just, you know, just, just start shooting. If you work with people that don't, actors that have never been in front of the camera before, maybe they're just brilliant the first time. And then if you hadn't had the camera on, you get like kind of panic and then you have to talk about why they were brilliant the first time and they don't understand that because they don't realize why they were brilliant mm. the first time and then you lost the moment mm. yeah, i mean uh, an actor that worked for many years they probably know okay i was brilliant because i did this and this mm. and you can talk about it that's why i get so provoked when people say this is how you work with actors i go my my god every actor is different you know it's about your relationship to that actor and that actor comes from and probably maybe a school that could be have another you know uh, uh, ideal how you should act or don't doesn't have uh, been to school at all. I, I worked with a lot of actors that been brilliant that didn't go to any schools, and and then what you get that is some raw material that is right mm. uh, that you could steal, mm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's <laughs> it's is kind of hard because maybe sometimes they don't know what you're doing. But you see what they're doing and you get it in the camera. But if you talk to them, explain what they're doing, it doesn't mean that they are getting better. It can be worse yeah. because then they start to analyze myself and think about myself. OK, did I do this? That you want this or, you know, so then it's more about be helping them to relax. Mm. But if you work with an actor that has been like in the business l much longer than you and worked with so many directors, they know everything. How do you get a, the best performance out of an actor? The base has to has to be done before you get to set because if you if you agree, okay, what is the character? You can basically talk about it and solve these problems mm -hmm. kind of fast. And sometimes it's just you know the poor character didn't get any sleep yesterday and are maybe nervous about the scene, and you need to talk about it to, just to to get her and, and him back on track. It's, 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 it's also about, um, yeah, about trust. And, uh, but I think it's good to be gentle if, because if you work with people that really want to do a good job and are really loyal to you, it's no need to, to be mean and angry. Mm. I don't understand that at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, it's no need. And it, my experience is that you just afraid, you make people afraid. Mm. So it's more like, you know, just explain the vision and people, you know, can relax and trust the vision and, and you can move on. Mm. Uh, of course, I had, uh, there was a few times I had people that I really thought like, okay, you're not doing your best or just didn't care what mm. I was saying. Uh, not anymore so much, but in the beginning I mm. got like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I just said, I remember once I said, uh, but I would never say, but I remember <laughs> one, one, it was just a small rod. I said, I, 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 we tried and tried and tried and he didn't, you know, he just didn't care what I was saying. I took him aside and I say, you're so bad now. This looks like really shit. Do you want to come out in this film and be one like the baddest actor in this film? Or yeah. do you want to, you know, jump on board and just start working the way we others are working? Yeah. And it worked, you know, because <laughs> everybody is afraid. But I wouldn't, you know, this is something I wouldn't say. Uh, I, I, I can't imagine saying that to, to an actor that I worked with uh, recently, yes, because it's not, 
it, my experience is that people are really, really doing their best, putting their heart into what they're doing, and it's no need to 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 be uh, unpolite or, mm. or yeah, no, no, I don't. I don't think you get anything better out of it either. Mm. Yes, people. I people get uh, uh, very anxious and and sad, which I don't think is the good energy to work in. No. Mm. How is the, how is the what is the difference between uh, directing an ensemble like Love and Anarchy or say two lead actors or uh, like mm. in Pure or mm. uh, to this mm. effect? Mm. Yeah, my film Hotel was a little bit yeah. like Love and Anarchy that that there was this group and the group energy has to be in a certain way and then it's then it's important that that the, the actors also feel good with each other i think that's really a gift for you on set that mm. they really you know so it's more about uh, create a generous atmosphere and uh, you know uh, uh that i like the like i said about my first play i like the idea which i also got from the theater that is okay everybody's here because we wanted you to be here right so 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 there's no way to be. There's no need to be afraid because you're here because you were so good and we wanted to work with you and we love you, right? Mm. So it's so it's it's uh, to create that atmosphere. Also, you know, it spreads over the other actors and the actors can also get relationship and you know they they find it more. It also depends if it's a humor sure. with a tempo like this or if it's drama, which is like a yeah. kind of heavy. So it's I love when you have the feeling of an ensemble because you get so much. The actors starting to do so, such a brilliant things by themselves, which happened a lot of time in, in Love and Anarchy, that they had so, so such a wonderful flow. So they could then then you have the same flow as the vision, and if they have the same flow as the vision, you could get so much uh, good ideas from the actors, which are brilliant for the visions that you even even find yourself, and you just have to be open to that also. It must be different directing a feature film and. And, and a long series, mm. right? For me, it's the same process. It's it's the same process from from the beginning, and uh, but of course, uh, uh, TV is longer. It's more material, so it's mm. and, and have longer lines in terms of the characters and the story and developing and everything. And you have to be uh, more uh, for on set for a longer longer period, or you're split with another director. And yeah, so it's it it's. It's different. Um, I think, for me, it's the same. It's the sa I have the same. Uh, I have the same ambition in everything I do. I don't go down in ambition when I do TV, and I get really, really sad and uh, provoked also when I when I when <laughs> when I work with people. They say, "Okay, this is just a TV series," so it's like because that's something I could. I I, I I felt a change from from doing feature films uh, and TV that maybe people around you think, okay, this is just a TV series, so it doesn't really matter that, that much. And that thing, I think just, I don't work like that. I just think it's boring and depressing to have that thought. Um, film versus digital. My sh first uh, short film in 2005 or something like that and that was just you know then there was a lot about a lot of people talked about oh it's so so much better for the quality to shoot on film and and, and I remember <coughs> some people saying oh you have to shoot on film you have to shoot on film on um, and then we shot on, dig on a digital yeah. uh, camera and and it was for me who have never uh, been on set before I could not have done that film without the digitalized uh, camera because I, I could shoot, 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 shoot. I could test, 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 test. Uh, and it, the funny thing with the story is like in the end, I remember when we were screening this short film, one of these um, old school film guys came to me and said, yeah, it was so good that you shot on real film. You could really see the difference. And I got like, mm, yeah, it's did it. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't see the difference that he was really so obsessed yeah, up. So, yeah. so I think and, and, and in terms of quality, I mean, the camera has gone so uh, developed in, 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 a, in a way that you could choose to film digitalized, but it looks like film. To me, it's more about the difference between film and TV in a way. Like yeah. it's because TV and film now are basically the same. 
uh, in a way, mm. uh, if you think about streaming and what the distribution mm. is. And mm. what are your feelings on streaming, uh, streaming that it's changed the way movies are watched, ultimately? I think it's, I mean, it opens also up new opportunities for people that are not established, for example, to come into the film, dis uh, film business. Hopefully it's going to get more easy for people that come outside the business to do their own stuff and maybe because it's so much cheaper and so on. It is a problem if the stories end up not meaning anything to anyone. I mean, why should we do them? So it's like, of course, it's a, of, of course it's a question, but that's something also for the whole society. <laughs> like everything happens so fast and, you know, books and da 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 But I think, uh, but I think this is a question because sometimes you say like, okay, is the, is the, is the streaming company's uh, fault that this has happened? But I would say it's also a question to, to the creators. What do you want to do? Because the creators, they are really doing this. So I think also sometimes, because I see beautiful things that's been done uh, for, like you said, like a TV series that is so well done and so good that it, it, could, be, it could be as well as a film. It's a conflict sometimes between the money and the art mm -hmm. or the soul of the project or, 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 or the ambition. And the filmmaker is responsible for the soul and the money is responsible for the money. <laughs> and it's always been that dance between, you know, in the industry, but sometimes you feel those days that the money is getting more and more, you know, space, uh, but, but it's also our responsible as filmmakers to defend the quality or, or, or the soul or, or the story, basically, what we really want to say. Mm. So I think this, I think, I think filmmakers should organize more and get more, you know, uh, rise their backs and, you know, say, okay, you want this, but we are the one that's doing it to find uh, our rights. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Do you think, uh, as a writer, director, do, ha do you have uh, a moral obligation to the, to the audience? Yes, I do. You have to be <laughs> honest in a way. And I would say honest, I don't mean honest that you mean that you had to be a good person and you had to tell a nice story and so on. But I think honesty to the vision, uh, to, 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 to kind of um, uh, not have an other interests than the story. I think, the, I think your main uh, 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 obligation or what you have to do, you have to try to get, tell the story that, that in a good way. And, and also I think you have a responsibility to ask for, is this story important or not? Because sometimes it feels like directors um, t seem to forget that they can say no to projects. It's, everything should not be done. It's just, it's also that because we're doing it. So we can also say, no, we should not do that kind of films. We want to do this kind of films. And I think sometimes, we, we seem to forget that, uh, that, that, that to ask yourself, is this story that something that the world needs? <laughs> Maybe that's a good question, a, a big question, and it might be hard to answer, but I, I think that's a duty as a director. Mm. What's the most difficult part of directing? To have uh, all the energy that you need, I think. Yeah. I think it's uh, to, 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 to be the best you can in every situation and just uh, have the energy all the way to do that. And also, uh, I mean, it's different parts in the beginning. It's more when it comes to, to find the right story. I think it's hard to, it's a cruel process in a way because you have to be so honest to yourself and you have to kill your ideas and you say, okay, this is not good enough. And, but it's important that you not are too hard on yourself because at the hand, <laughs> then you won't make anything. So it's like this balance. But as a director, I would say, if I know what I, if I have a clear vision, uh, then it's more, uh, then it's kind of easy to stay with the vision if the vision is clear. But mm. that's, if you have a clear vision, it's more, of having the energy to, you know, go all the way with all these people that you have to meet all the day and be the best on set every day, every day, every day, because there's no room for, for anything else. And just to push yourself to have that energy all the way. I think, I, I, to me, that's, that's the hardest, uh, hardest thing to be a director. Actually. If you could, in one sentence, give advice to an aspiring director, just one sentence. Choose your fights, maybe. Hmm? Choose your fights, yeah, okay. Just a couple of your influences, if you have. I was thinking about that, but I so uh, you know I'm so 
unfaithful. I have so many influencers. <laughs> I mean, it's also always wonderful to look at Apocalypse Now, now, now we're done <laughs> as a director, <laughs> because it gives you just energy. You yeah. get the feeling that everything is possible. Yeah. And you, s you realize, okay, uh, I'm not in that shit. I have a daughter, my oldest daughter is well. And when she comes to me and says, this is so good, you have to see this. I think it's my duty to see it and to just, you know, mm -hmm. because this is the next generation. What does she want? I mean, uh, well, why do you like this? Uh, right. We watch Squid, I mean, I watched Squid Game. I watched Strange thing, Stranger Things. I thought, I think I thought so with her like 10 times or maybe like, but I also would go back and I can watch a Bergman film, you know, for mm. the 10th time in my life or, yeah. you know, so I'm very open, yeah. Uh, if you were to ask Mikkel Marsaman a question, what would that be? Oh, I mean, the most imp interesting thing for me would be what he's go what he's up to now and what's the struggle with it. Because I think sometimes directors, they struggle a lot with, you know, ideas and financing and all this struggle is uh, it's such a lonely process, which I think that we should share more and talk about like, okay, I got, you know, I worked with this for so many years and got, I finally I got a no, you know, and they just, you know, I lost all my dreams and all the, to, to, because it's a really, it could be really, really lonely to push these big projects in front of you. So one question uh, that would be actually, what are you up to now? Mm -hmm. And Santa Lincoln? What are you up to now? <laughs> Let me say thank you. Thank you.